Hello Bitbutter. I'm making this video response to you, particularly because I fit within the categories of the people that you're addressing in your video. I'm an atheist. I'd probably be somewhere on the left wing politically, somewhere between a progressive and a socialist. I don't make this video in an attempt to, you know, deliberately be combative or argumentative. This is more like an attempt to start a conversation on the subject of anarchy. This is in order to get you to understand your position better and to also understand the problem other people have with your position. You did mention that anarchists are among the most reviled people in society and especially in the political scene and that is true but I think that's mainly because most people misunderstand and because most people don't actually take the time to read an opponent's political theory. I don't think anarchists are correct. I don't think it's the correct political solution. But it's a better solution than dominism, for instance. And I make this video just in order to get a conversation started. Hopefully you'll respond to this video, you'll respond to my criticisms, and I'll be able to respond to that video. Through this exchange, I'll understand your position better, you'll understand my criticisms better, and anybody who's interested in watching the exchange would be able to understand both of our positions better. Now, the title of my video is Deliberate. I deliberately titled my video, A Defense of the State as a Concept. That's because you raised two criticisms in your video two very distinct criticisms, one of which is the criticism of the status quo, this concept of the elite governing the proletariat, this concept of you know the lack of social mobility, inequality. I, I agree with you there. I really do. I think there are a lot of problems within states. Uh, first of all, the word state could mean a theocracy, it could mean uh, you know, despotic dictatorship. It could mean a liberal democracy. Even if it's at its mildest form, which is the liberal democracy, there are problems within the state structure. And I agree with you that these are problems that need to be addressed. The thing is, I don't think that anarchy is actually to these problems. If you destructure the state, and you think that that's going to be a solution to social inequality and economic stratification, you're basically making the assumption that economic stratification is a social conception, it's a social product. That's what makes you know, somebody elite and makes somebody else a commoner and makes somebody else you know, junk. But the fact of the matter is that people who are socially elite, people who are socially in the middle, people who are considered social junk, uh, there's a difference between the three, and the main difference isn't socially created. The main difference is a disparity in available resources. And you're right, the state sometimes does function to maintain or even enhance these inequalities. But these are problems within the state paradigm that we have to address within the state paradigm. If the state destructured into anarchy, that wouldn't provide a solution to these things at all. You would just have the same economically stratified people living without a state and at the same time living with despairing levels of uh, resources available. Take, for example, if Texas you know, broke up and became several small different communities of anarchists. Um, suppose community A is a really elite community and it's got really nice houses and more importantly they have a lot of material resources. They're going to be better armed they're going to be better supplied. And I, there are still going to be elites to Community B. Even if Community B removes itself from the social structure, they, are, they still have less resources than Community A. The point I'm making is social stratification is based on despairing resources, not based on some kind of socially created concept. I mean, it could be, but primarily the difference between these, the different classes in society is how much wealth they have attained. Now, the second argument you make is more of an argument against the concept of a state. And this is the adoption of confederal socialists' argument that the state is basically based on violence. This is true. One of any political science class that you take that discusses the state will ultimately 
convey to you that one of the properties that a state has is the monopoly on the use of violence. You consider this to be a form of terrorism. You consider this to be immoral. I consider this to be a necessary evil. Let me explain. Throughout human history, there hasn't been a single society on earth that has not had some form of coercion apparatus. This is necessary because despite all the pomp and despite all the way we dress up our behaviors, human interaction is basically dis different contracts. Some of these contracts are implicit, some of these contracts are explicit, and the thing these contracts all share in common is there needs to be some form of social coercion in order to make the whole concept of a contract function. If I sign a contract with you today that stipulates that you do something and that I do something and that you keep up your share of the contract and I violate our contract, the entire notion of the contract as some kind of guarantee is based on the fact that you or the state can somehow punish me for violating the contract. If you create a contract and we both sign it and the contract is based on the fact that we both agree to adhere to the contract without any kind of punishment for those who violate the contract. You and I might adhere to the contract, but it, it, it would violate the notion of a contract. There would, there would be no need to adhere to the contract. The thing is, you assume when you posit that contracts can exist without some form of punishment, that people are rational actors and they are for the most part you assume that people function based on enlightened self-interest and they do on the most part most people will be quite happy attaining their social aims cooperatively most people will be quite happy attaining their social aims with other people also attaining their social aims the problem is there are things that supersede this kind of enlightened self-interest you have notions of dogma, you have notions of superiority, you have notions, all types of notions that may lead one person to another kind of self-interest, and that is selfish self-interest. Dogma can even lead people to abandon self-interest entirely and throw themselves on top of grenades or don suicide vests and walk into cafes knowing that they are never going to walk out. So the assumption that people function on this kind of rational calculation is not entirely evidenced and it's a horrible assumption to base a political paradigm on you know even if I gave you that people do act for the most part rationally even if I did give you that most people act for the most part rationally there's still gonna be a minority that doesn't and if you have a minority that doesn't and you have some kind of social agreement in place that minority is gonna be free to violate that social agreement without some kind of coercive apparatus like the military or the police. What's going to prevent this from happening? My second criticism of this notion that you put forward is the assumption that all people are willing and able to care for themselves. I don't particularly think that this is true. I think that if you, if the option is between caring for yourself and working and dying, that most people, most able people, will work and work very hard but that's that's the problem the qualification I had to put in that statement most able people what about orphans who have no kin what about elderly who have no kin what about people with disabilities is the kindness of strangers enough to guarantee that these people are going to be taken care of do you care what happens to these people because intrinsically some kind of social structure some kind of state structure is necessary in order to look after the people who fell through the cracks and I care about those people and I just want to know within your paradigm where do these people fit in who looks after the elderly the mentally ill the orphans just as a quick summary the criticisms I base here are two first of all when you discuss elites and you discuss social stratification you're not criticizing the concept of the state you're criticizing the way the state is secondly when you discuss violence as the basis of the state you're correct but coercion is the basis of all human agreements and it's impossible to form a society without having human agreements 
So how would you enforce these human agreements without the resort to violence, without some kind of coercion apparatus? And how would you address the question of all the people who are not capable of looking after themselves? Where would they fit within your social structure? Just a few thoughts. <laughs>